The surge is a succubi. Her beauty is unmatched, her hair craves your hands gliding through it, every exquisite inch of her beckons to be caressed. But it isn't pleasure that your lips find upon carnal adoration, it's a subtle poison. It starts slowly too, with a few inconsistencies, but by the conclusion, her phantasm is complete and everything you thought you enjoyed is transformed into a visage of hell. The first few hours are a perfect blend of systems, expositional breadcrumbs and a setting that begs discovery. A dystopian future where industry and machinery is king, you find yourselves in the capable hands of Warren on his first day of work for a corporate giant known as Creo. Creo proselytizes the importance of Project Utopia, and how slowly, yet dedicatedly, the world can be mended. But something has gone horribly wrong, and your introduction involves scaffolding, bone drills, and zero anesthesia. Now equal parts man and machine, you venture off into a scrap heap of disemboweled technology with a trusty pipe in hand. That is all you really need to know about the Surge's plot, as everything else is forced down your throat through the use of audio logs and dense intercom soliloquies. The exposition is so thick you'd need a surgical tool just to cut through it. As people elaborate on the state of the world, at length, and oftentimes with the slowest delivery of dialogue I've seen in a video game, they say a considerable amount while still actually saying very little. There is potentially a good mystery here, but it's diluted by procrastinating detail that we really didn't need. All the while this is happening, the surge is impressing with pretty lighting, unique exo character models, and a consistent visual aesthetic. Grated walkways cascade sun rays from broken warehouse windows. Dark drenched tunnels promise terror within their depths. Sparks and cinders dance as malfunctioning machines continue their workload amidst the blood streaks and dead co-workers. Of course on Xbox One it looks like it was coloured in by children with crayons due to a much lower resolution, so buyers beware on that version. The visual fidelity is lowered intentionally though, as performance is the goal here. The surge runs at a consistent 30 frames per second, and only stutters under very specific instances of duress. Normally, I would chastise a game for not being 60, because that fidelity is so much higher, but where this game is concerned, I never, ever felt like it affected gameplay too much, and I always felt in control of my character. And because of this, I imagine that is why the load times are so fantastic in the surge. This is the greatest achievement of the game, outside of a, a rather enjoyable yet short-lived wheelchair tech. You'll notice that I've waxed poetic about story, graphics, and a portent of impending doom, but I haven't talked about the Surge's gameplay. That's deliberate, as that's where this pretty, well-performing package rides a slow chain into molten lava, the last remaining image that of a hand with the thumb firmly pointing down. The internet will run black with crude assertions that the Surge is a sci-fi souls game. I can understand this moniker, as it is fast and effective at communicating an idea quickly to a wide audience, but this is a crass comparison. If by souls you mean each game has a stamina bar, then you would be correct. If by souls you mean that each features methodical skill reward in combat, then you would be less right. The game also has an icon with a spanner on it, yet I wouldn't let it fix my sink. The Surge is closer to too human than any souls game, as it is ripe with interesting ideas and unique mechanics, but it fundamentally fails under scrutiny. So the first of the smoke and mirrors are the controls. The controls allow you to run, jump, evade, attack, and use a variety of sundries with ease. They are responsive and have the right amount of weight to them. By themselves, they appear fantastic. But much like most of the Surge, it is more about how they interact with other systems that shines lights on the flaws. Combat has you choosing between horizontal and vertical attacks. This is a great concept that is almost entirely superfluous in the grand scheme of the game. I see no reason why there was not enemies who demanded horizontal attacks and punished vertical, or scenarios where intelligent use was promoted, but alas, such inflection has literally no effect. You'll be spamming the running attack anyway, so this discussion is pointless, but there is no good reason why the fundamental core of the combat is completely unexplored. And it gets better. The second tenet that makes the combat interesting is the limb selection and dismemberment. With a flick of the right analogue while locked on, you can select between limbs of your opponent. Unarmoured areas take more damage, but result in no new equipment for dismembering them. Armoured parts are more durable, but pay into the currency of equipment upgrades by literally cutting from them their armour for you to wear. This concept is similarly fantastic, in theory. In practice, it leads to an immense emphasis on grinding, and a lot less on affecting combat. How, you ask? Well, much like the idea of directional attacks, the limbs can be completely ignored with little to no ramifications. The armour itself affects the flow of battle, as depending on the stability rating, the higher the stat, the less effective your weapons will be at stunning your opponents. The weapons themselves 
has a measure of impact that can be augmented to dictate how much stun you deliver with each hit. All of these factors should promote a hierarchy of attacking and defending, stunning and eviscerating, knowledge overcoming adversity, but all of these are ignored by the hyper armor that litters the game. Certain enemy types literally have passive automatic counterattacks, ignoring any offensive systems you believe to be true. All of these components combined, you have encounters where your attacks can obliterate enemies with no prayer of fighting back, then juxtapose with the exact same enemy hyperarming through your exact same assault and killing you instantly. Once again, the first area was a glorious bait and switch with this. Slow, shambling zombies in Cameron's Aliens power loaders are the first fodder to your blade. They have slovenly but impactful, deliberate swings. This introduces the player to the cadence of attacking and defending, but this rhythm is a lie, as the best strategy is to get the heaviest weapon and spam the running attack until everything dies. This avoids the dice rolling hyper armor game that the surge can be at times. Never is this more noticeable than when you fight the security guard enemies, or the rough interruption you get on the second level, where all of those interesting combat interactions are replaced by incredibly fast berserker enemies and a hammer guy with incredible hyper armor and gifts of one touch resets. The combat on paper is simple. You target limbs, with each attack you gain energy. Once your energy is high enough you gain access to implant abilities that help you in battle, or instead, you can cash in the energy with an execution finisher that may grant you some hard earned loot. On the surface, all of these parts amass into a pleasant hole that is enjoyable for the first few hours, but over time, atrophy sets in and stagnation begins. Simplistic combat with the illusion of depth is not actual depth. By the end of the game, the only thing that will improve is yourself as a player. The systems remain the same, entirely, and this is not engaging enough, as the combat is only as interesting as the enemies you engage in with it. The Souls games are rich in enemy diversity. Every area introduces a new threat and promises fresh risk. The Surge, as much as people like to assert its Soulsian inheritance, does not. The game has around five enemy types with slight variations here and there. Each has a profound weakness that can be easily exploited. The worst of these are Hyper Armor Heavies who simply turn both the rules and the fun off on the game. But the worst enemy in the game is hands down the security guard type. This enemy is unique in that it has a hard counter to your running attack, and a counter attack with zero telegraphing. If this wasn't bad enough, they also come with a passive shoulder cannon that freezes you in place and fires independently of what the guards are doing. This leads to borderline broken frame traps that always end in death. None of this would be all that bad if it was an established part of the enemy behaviour, behaviours which are often more buggy than functional, but the security guards are the only one who can do this. On your first encounter, they don't respawn, which lends credence to the notion that they're special, and especially lethal because of this. But several hours later, you'll be getting gangbanged by dozens of them and they all respawn. The elegance of design falls down here. With such a small assortment of victims, your tools feel completely underutilized. You have all these options, but you'll only use a small amount to get the job done. The game never asks more of you, and the enemies never require more either. This may surprise some, as the dodge in the search has almost zero invincibility. This instantly changes the type of evasion needed. It stirs images of immaculate spacing and a high skill ceiling, but the game never elaborates on this, and most situations are easily avoided with simple distance. It could have been something really interesting, but it chose a lazier option, and the shallowness rears its head again. It's at this point where I want to discuss the parry in the surge, as it's funnier than the last 10 years worth of Adam Sandler movies in its incompetence. As a rule, parrying is a single, high skill, risk versus reward technique reserved only for the most skilled of players with practiced, confident timing. While apparently Deck 13 want everyone to win with very little effort, to understand how stupid the parry is, is to learn how fundamentally broken the block is. In most Souls inspired titles, blocking is a powerful option. While limited by various factors, if you hold block, you generally mitigate damage at the cost of stamina. This is an established paradigm. Lords of the Fallen did this, Neo did this, Solitaire would do this if it swapped genres. The Surge doesn't! Holding block in the Surge is the same as throwing a knife directly above you in the air and closing your eyes. Did you take damage? Who bloody knows? That's how consistent the defensive technology in this game is. One time your block will be god tier, another, you will die in a myriad of low tier excuses. You'll start to question unblockable properties, spacing requirements, a whole host of unknowables. The only thing for sure is that the block is wonky and unreliable, hence why most of the people on YouTube and Twitch are never using it. This is a mistake, as the parry that is utilised via the block 
is completely broken. The tooltip on the loading screen mentions blocking with good timing before an enemy attack to interrupt them with a counter. The timing required to do this is so hilariously accessible, you could conceive and birth a child in the interim. And the counter attacks do really good damage. Certain enemy types can be decimated by two of them, and the technique is so embarrassingly easy, it requires no effort or practice. Why is this so? Parrying is meant to be difficult but rewarding. It shouldn't be a medal for taking place. Such practices breed complacency, they do not make one lust for improvement. The most delicious irony here is the game has a high skill counter option that they hide from you until the second level. While guarding, you can duck or jump over attacks allowing for a powerful counteract. Once again, this is a fascinating design that could really be cool, but the surge in almost legendary Mandingo fashion seems to take great pleasure in cuckolding itself as ducking or jumping can only be utilised against very specific attacks with rather strict timing, whereas twice as many attacks can be shield parried with zero timing and zero skill needed. So why ever do the hard one? It doesn't even do more damage, as it should. And the irony expands, as the counter you do after jumping or ducking can actively be counter hit. So you duck with precision, counter with great execution, and Hyper Armor fucks you. Thanks for playing, shop's closed. What planet are we on where this is a thing? So moving past the sheer stupidity of two skill-based horizontal dodges in a game where almost every enemy uses vertical attacks, we find ourselves incredibly underwhelmed by the promise of precision and depth, where only shallow amateur mechanics arise. All of this said, the combat can be fun, but it reeks of lost potential. I initially thought that the limbs would have armor ratings, and each attack would lower it until breaking, then any broken armour would be susceptible to being cut. I also thought that cutting limbs would alter the enemy behaviours, incentivising dismemberment and strategy. Imagine a fierce foe with a wicked right hook that hits you every time. Now imagine breaking that arm, sundering it, and removing the only option you couldn't dodge. Imagine slowing an enemy down who is too swift to avoid normally by crippling his legs, akin to a dark gun deathclaw strategy. Imagine enemies behaving differently once limbs were torn, similar to Ninja Gaiden 2, where once injured, they move much slower, but grab ferociously in order to suicide you. All of these ideas already exist, but can be added to and improved. The Surge does none of these things. It rests on its laurels of our one mechanics that weren't complicated or overly interesting then, even less so 20 hours in. And it's all a shame. And other aspects show both promise, but eventual malady too. The levels look great, and reek with mechanised atmosphere, but once you leave the surface after the tutorial, you will come across the same corridors, factories, elevator shafts and maintenance tunnels. With several environments you would think such repeating elements would not be present, but the core design is too obsessed with exolifts and claustrophobic tunnels. So in spite of office buildings, greenhouses and executive forums, each of the connecting areas seem copy pasted and undercut the differing scenery. It leads to environmental fatigue, on top of combat fatigue, and enemy fatigue. It all compounds with the labyrinthine quality of the level design that has almost no direction and revels in leaving the player lost. Each zone has a single medbay which serves as a leveling point and a checkpoint. The world is then a hive of interconnected shortcuts, some of which are interesting and well realised, others that are almost as long as the original journey and infinitely more taxing to traverse. They also come with very little signposting, but the game does that in general throughout its entire duration. It is never overtly telling the player where to go, it just kind of leaves it for them to figure out themselves. And where there is quality in this idea, there can also be frustration when you have such a rich and detailed environment that literally leaves you hanging. The shortcuts here are counterintuitive. Exploration is rewarded in a handful of ways, the greatest of which in this genre is a quicker stress-free avenue to a mountain you bled to climb. The Surge uses other bloodletting mountains as its shortcuts, and it doesn't work. Can you think of a moment in a Souls game where you went up three separate elevators, navigated tunnels and fought a handful of enemies in a single shortcut? Because I can't. Remember the rotating platforms in Stonefang? You stood on it for about 10 seconds and skipped half the level? That doesn't exist in the Surge. Egregious clipping and cheap deaths pinned in tunnels on both ends do, however. The game takes perverse pleasure in making you fight things in elongated phone booths, and it's about as fun as it sounds. It's not all doom and gloom though, there are some nice moments and some instances of great design. Shame as it is that only the shit ones will reign dominant in most people's memories. And it is the bad parts you'll remember, because the good ones are so sparse and often forgettable. 
A lot of the surge is forgettable. Seemingly how the devs forgot to design more than five bosses, forgetting how amazing the Lord Vessel felt after travelling so frequently between bonfires and thus omitting fast travel completely. Or Homeward Bones. Or how the combat screams for further complexity that never comes. Or the story that wants you to be interested so vehemently that it follows you persistently like a fart on a bus. Several moments of the game seem to want to enact a horror element, with the use of darkness, intimidating audio, and potential jump scares. But it's all so half-assed that it misses the mark. The shuffling zombie enemies and limb emphasis harken back to Dead Space, but the game jumps around tone-wise almost indifferently. I think a darker, slower, more horror focus could have helped the surge a lot. It could have followed out an interesting niche for itself, but it settled for less. Much like the leveling system believes less is more, and exists solely to push the loot limb mechanic on players. Leveling in the surge gives you power, an arbitrary statistic that governs the gear you can wear and the implant passives you can use. That's it. It doesn't make you stronger, doesn't make you faster, better, more improved. It exists for the single purpose of allowing you to carry more shit. It's a gaming fanny pack and it baffles my mind. Armor increases your defense and gives passive benefits like increasing impact, stability, stamina, regen and the like. But nothing makes you deal more damage. The armors seem completely devoid of offensive benefits and are exclusively defensive. So what happens when you have a player like me who gives zero shits about defense, doesn't care if he dies in one hit, but wants to hit like a freight train? Well, you have another grand failure of design in the surge. So power level allows for greater armor and greater defense. The only thing left is implants. Implants are perks that can be equipped at the cost of energy and offer various tiers of effects. They range from more healing items, to healing with energy, to healing when you're close to dying, to more HP. Do you see where I'm going with this? The implant diversity is so focused on improving the player's pussy that they don't feel their male genitalia receding into their bodies. This is where the game could have come alive with various options and builds for every delectation, but there's nothing. Nothing augments damage, nothing increases attack, no tear stone range, nothing. The implants are practically worthless for an offensively minded player. All of these issues infect the whole core of leveling up. They hollow the system out completely and make it feel underwhelming. I beat the game at level 55. I spent most of it at level 30. Everybody tells me that level 85 and 100 is underleveled for some of the areas that I conquered. I feel like I was just as weak and vulnerable at hour 1 as I was by hour 20. So what would leveling up even achieve? This is not how character progression is supposed to work. You're meant to feel more capable, more powerful. I respect the notion of the player improving over build improvements, but it completely kills the power fantasy. It also murders the overall sense of game progress. When you undercut and underwhelm with your leveling and augmentations, you have a souls-like where build matters not and all you are left with is mechanics. As expressed earlier, the surge is a pretty mirage at a distance, but up close it crumbles. So what are you left with if you don't slot into the HP engorging easily impressed masses? Weapon upgrades. Weapon upgrades are locked to corresponding tiers of upgrade materials dropped by specific enemies, effectively gating your damage output to the point of complete castration. Then you have weapon proficiencies, a stat that is barely explained but passively improves over time as you use a weapon. The assumption is that the higher the level, the better you are with the weapon you're using and the more damage it does, but this mechanic is overzealously grindy, requiring a large amount of dedication to raise. Polymerize this with the loot and dismemberment system that makes farming so boring, you have even less incentive to indulge in the combat. That doesn't even bring up the clause that weapon proficiency leads to player tunnel vision and focusing on a single tool, ignoring the game's modest armory. This is saddening too, as the weapons in the game are genuinely interesting and would be fun to use if hyper armor wasn't so all encompassing and proficiency wasn't so damning to less ventured options. Then there are the bosses. How do you make a Souls-inspired game with five bosses in it? Isn't that like making a Call of Duty without firearms in a rather controversial pacifist edition? Neo had over 30 bosses, Lords of the Fallen had over 10. The Surge has five. So they must be the most incredible bookends to each chapter imaginable, right? They're horrible! It's a fucking courtesy, an act of clemency that the game has so little of them, as the ones present are about as interesting as other people's children. The first boss is a lanky Ed 209 wannabe with some of the laziest animations I've seen in a video game. It features a knockdown mechanic where striking the boss fills an orange bar. 
When the orange bar is full, you assume the boss should fall and rules of nature should play and the chaos that follows will be beautiful. Only the boss doesn't fall. You strike it several more times, dealing zero damage with zero knockdowns, leading you to question the purpose of the orange bar! The second boss is stronger in design, but with only a few attacks, none of which that are particularly threatening, killing the boss is more an act of kindness to escape the awkwardness that is how anyone thought that such basic patterns were acceptable in a post-NES era of gaming. Has anyone played Devil May Cry? God of War? God Hand? Insert game with great enemies and bosses? These games have enemies that are more richly designed than the bosses in The Surge. How is such mediocrity receiving revel? Why do we suffer so willfully? The third boss is a puzzle boss made more difficult by a sporadic camera. The fourth boss flees from battle to heal and summons the first boss! Five bosses? And one of them summons a previous boss! Just let that sink in! The worst of all is how limited the boss's movesets are. Three to five attacks is not enough to challenge a player's expectations. The only real challenge present is the dishonest hitboxes and the animation cancelling rife between all bosses. That's if the animations are even there at all, as some of them have almost no telegraphs and just resonate with cheapness. It's a disgrace. Lords of the Fallen was a flawed game, but the bosses had qualities. None of the ones present in the Surge are deserving of kind words. Bosses are such a pivotal part of a game to get wrong. They're the arteries tying each element together, a proving ground to future problem solving. Here, they're wisdom teeth without the hope for removal. The only reason half of them are entertained at all is because they hit like trucks. But this is nothing new, as everything in the surge hits incredibly hard. From the beginning to the end, enemies will one-shot you. Even in high-level armor with health upgrades, one-hit kills can still find you. Some will call this challenge and construct impressive ballets of apologetics of difficulty. I think it's just lazy. You can make a game difficult without instantly murdering the player with every touch. But expecting such things is wishful thinking from a developer that made only five bosses, a handful of enemies, and combat that never aspires far from the rudimentary. So what is left? A promising lady of the night, cutting a salacious silhouette in the vespers of moonlight, but upon closer inspection, her words were ephemeral deceptions and her lips are wet with venom. The Surge had so much promise. A future ruled by technology, an opportunity for scale unmatched by its competitors. Statistics and builds so far reaching that every playstyle was catered for, weapons that would make Gundams blush, huge bosses the size of skyscrapers, as rich and diverse as any Transformer. Combat that evolved with your character, dodges that demanded precision and spacing, with every animation so florid they exude the love imparted by creator. A story that made you care. A character that didn't just immediately accept an operating machine raping him and now he's killing everything that moves. Somewhere else, there's a version of the Surge that was worth the wait, but this isn't it. The Surge could have injected a fresh feed of energy into a genre some are feeling fatigued by. And whereas it does have qualities, it mostly feels like its soul is absent, and all that's left are empty comparisons to considerably better games.